We are treating the earth like an addict treats their body. About 10 years ago, I lost a family member to suicide due to alcoholism, untreated alcoholism. And I felt so terrible about it that I thought I should leave the field of psychology. And about two days after his death, this conviction was growing inside of me. And that night, I had a dream. A shaman came to me in the dream and said, I have a message from your stepfather. You are to continue your work. Well, I woke up very intimidated and resigned. And I knew the work he was talking about was the research I had been doing on the history of addictions in the field of psychology, which has been bumpy pretty much from the beginning. Both Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung felt that their rational approach of sitting and talking with somebody and creating insight was no match for the instinctual force of addictions. Now, what do they mean by instinctual force? Well, addictions come in and occupy our primary and foundational programming as a species. And they do this by hijacking the pleasure reward system. So in balance, the pleasure reward system and instincts work in tandem. Let's say you're hungry and you need to eat so you can survive. Your pleasure reward system will help seek out and find the nutritional food that will keep you going and help give you sustenance. But out of balance in an addictive state, this pleasure reward system forgets how much is too much because it gets a euphoric hit and it just wants more and more and more and begins to become very focused on this. So if you've ever had a conversation with an alcoholic or an addict who you're trying to get to stop using, the conversation might go a little bit like this. Okay, I, you work up your nerve and you get ready and you go to them and you say, okay, I really think you have a problem and you need to cut it out. And the alcoholic will say, okay, I'm only gonna drink on the weekends or I'll only drink wine, no more hard alcohol or I'll just have two drinks. And they may be able to do this for a little while, but then eventually they get back to where they were, and the implications and consequences of their drinking continue on. And so you may have a sense of what Freud and Jung were talking about. What happens here is that the addiction becomes the primary relationship in the addict's life. And they become so focused on keeping this intact that they will let family go, they will let friends go, they'll let work go, because they're pursuing that hit. And then you'll notice that they'll start to isolate, they'll lie, addictions erode our values. They will start to lie, they will, they will stop thriving essentially, and you'll see that maybe they feel sorry for themselves or they're not learning anymore. And as I considered these behaviors and the behavior of my stepfather who isolated a lot, I thought to myself, addiction really is a form of extinction. Well, unfortunately, this extinction is becoming a contagion. Across the US and around the world, we are seeing the numbers grow. And um, in 2016, SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse Mental Health Administration, released numbers that declared 22 million Americans ages 12 and up met the criteria for addiction and dependence, for, excuse me, abuse and dependence. 22 million. And that's probably a very conservative number because most addicts don't admit they have a problem until the consequences are glaring. So, but there is something much deeper and much more serious going on. And that is our pleasure reward system and survival instinct have been manipulated in other ways. 
And this is putting not only our own species in peril, but other species on the planet as well. And this is because our pleasure reward system and instincts are so out of balance. Scientists from the fields of paleontology, biology, environmental science declare we have entered the sixth mass extinction. And what they mean by mass is that over 50% of the species will die. So this is very serious. In the history of the Earth, over 450 million years, there have been five previous mass extinctions, which were caused by natural occurrences like volcanoes or rising waters, or an asteroid hit the Earth and caused a dust storm for about six months. But this extinction, this sixth mass extinction, is different. It's an outlier because it's human-caused. We are doing it. And many scientists are earnestly pointing out that it's being done and how we're doing it, but we really need to start to understand why. And addiction is one disorder where people will harm their bodies, they'll destroy their lives, they'll just blow up their families because they are in denial about the impact of their behavior and the effect it is having. And I believe that we are treating the earth like an addict treats their bodies. So one of the ways we do this is through overconsumption, right? And this is very serious. The Global Footwork uh, Network declared that we have already, in eight months, used up our year allotted time of consumption. So we are really just moving at levels that are not sustainable. And one of the things that fuels overconsumption is the consumer movement, which is driven by marketing and advertising. And marketing and advertising directly affect, directly communicate with our unconscious and our natural instinctual drives. They appeal to our survival instinct by making us feel like if we don't get that thing, if we don't have it, we will not survive. We won't be happy. Maybe our friends won't like us. Something really terrible could happen, and so we should get that thing. Or they appeal to the pleasure reward system by saying, you're gonna feel great if you get this. You're gonna get a hit. We all know the term retail therapy, right? Right. So an interesting um, an industry that we've really seen this take effect is the fashion industry, which used to have four seasons and now has 11 to 15 seasons a year. It's pretty crazy. Okay, so what do we do? There was an anti-addiction campaign that was very successful, and that was the anti-smoking campaign. You may remember it. In 1960, about 42% of Americans smoked, and even doctors had their brand that they liked and, and promoted. But we have been able to drive those numbers down to about 16%. And how do we do that? This, I think, is very important for us to learn more about these campaigns. The first thing we did was we discerned the truth from the tobacco companies, and we told them that they were putting out false information. And then we told them, you can't advertise anymore. And so they had to get rid of their advertising that were alluring people into smoking. And then we started our own advertising campaign, which was a bit confrontative and harsh, but effective. And then we had public boundaries, where we said, you can't smoke on that airplane, you can't smoke in this section of the restaurant, or in fact, you can't smoke in this restaurant at all. And these public boundaries help people with their personal boundaries, with their friends and their family. And people will, were able to internalize these boundaries. And it really helped reduce the numbers. So I know that addiction is very difficult to treat. I'm not denying that. 
but I know we can treat it individually and collectively through awareness and education. And I believe that if we learn more about what happens when the pleasure reward system is imbalanced and what it feels like when it's balanced, we will be able to get there. But first we have to really understand the signs of when the pleasure reward system is out of balance. Things like rationalization, denial, obsession, craving, lying, isolation, and self-pity. Those are some of the most obvious ones. And so if you just watch your own experience and the experience of people around you, you'll begin to notice and learn. And I think that this could help us going forward. Thank you so much.